Hi, everybody. I'm Erica Muller, your host of Vacation Rentals Are the Future. Um, I have a 21-year background in real estate and 15 years in vacation rental investments. So I am super excited to be here hosting this show. This has been my life for the last 15 years. Um, I love watching the developments of what's going on in Hawaii and how they're moving forward with different restrictions, regulations, a lot of investment capital coming to the island. Um, so I'm very excited to bring on our guest tonight, who is Lilan Bento. She has been in real estate in the, the Big Island for eight and a half years, and she is born and raised in Hawaii with a deep background in government. So she really understands the restrictions and regulations probably a lot more than most people. So um, without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce Lilan to you. Thanks for being here, Lilan. Thank you so much, Erica, for having me on the show. I'm excited to touch on such a, you know, main topic in selling real estate here in Hawaii. And so I'm ready to just dive in and just see yeah. how each is different and how our state's different and how people can invest in vacation rentals here. Yeah. So, um, you know, I am so passionate about vacation rentals, but um, I think it's really cool about your background. I want to talk a little bit about that because I don't meet too many real estate agents that have such a, 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 back, a big background in government. And so if you could tell me a little bit about that, because I think that really helps you um, do what you do so well. And um, I'd love to learn more about what you were doing in your government position before this and uh, kind of what led you into getting into real estate after that. Yeah. Um, I worked for a former Hawaii governor. It was Governor Linda Lingo, and I worked in her office here on the Big Island. Um, my grandfather was a state senator for over 30 years, and so I grew up in politics and understanding um, government laws that are uh, being passed, which are just crucial because it does affect our everyday lives that people don't really understand, so it is important to vote, um, but also just working for a former government uh, governor and then being able to, after that, I went into hotel sales and then always wanted to get into real estate. My grandfather was big into real estate and finally just jumped in eight and a half years ago. And having that government background and knowing how to, you know, navigate through the different departments has truly saved so many of my clients from buying, you know, properties that either a law was going to be passed where, they were going to buy a vacation rental in the area. And then, you know, it, it would have changed right in the middle of that law was to pass. And so their investment just would have just gone down in value. And so knowing all of the different government departments and what laws are being passed, what's affecting our um, government um, is crucial in selling real estate in this state, I feel. Yeah, no, it is, especially with all the changes that they're, they're putting into place um, since right. October. Right. So um, I, you've been, you decided to get into real estate, but why vacation rentals? Is it because it was just such a popular investment there that you just fell into it? Or did you have like a passion for it? Tell me a little bit more about why that niche. This niche um, and selling on the outer island. So the outer islands are not the island of Oahu, which is the main island. Real estate on the other outer islands, as we call them, Kauai, Maui, Hawaii, which is this island you have your buyers are mostly investors. So you just sort of fall into the vacation rental uh, market um, besides the local community, whereas the island of Oahu, which is why they are passing that 90 day um, and a judge just did an injunction. Their county council tried to pass, the, you know, not having vacation rentals, stretch it out to 90 days. Um, but the outer islands is different. They're a little bit more lenient because most of our buyers are not the local community. Unfortunately, they are investors buying their either investment home or vacation home. Um, so you do immediately fall into that when you do sell in the outer islands real estate. So let me get your opinion around all these um, regulations that we were just mentioning, because um, they did kind of you, you mentioned they were just getting passed. Like, why do you feel that they passed them? Do you think that um, and there's really no wrong answer to this, but do you feel like that it's a government overreach to tell people what they can and can't do with their property? Or do you legitimately feel like that the vacation rentals that were happening there were legitimately a problem for the community? Um, what's the reason why you think this went through? It was a combination actually of the hotel industry, the hotel unions lobbying, right? Because the hotels were losing money. Um, they have all of these fees. And so people decided they got a little bit smart and, you know, they could, instead of I live by a hotel where our local rate is 1100 a night, plus all of those other fees, instead of, you know, going on vacation and then my entire family can stay in a home for a fraction of that cost. So it was, you know, when Airbnb and 
uh, VR Bill started really taking over. Um, people started getting smart and they would save a lot of money. These families traveling to Hawaii, which airfares are already astronomical to get here. Right. And so they decided, you know, we have a kitchen. We can actually all stay together. There's a pool instead of paying all of those hotel fees. And so the hotel industry really came down to politicians. And then there were um, vacation rentals in, I would say, maybe local subdivisions where you did have, you know, the entire subdivision, they were all working class families. And then you would have every once in a while, I would say a family, you know, barbecuing and maybe, you know, hanging out so early in the morning when you have the surrounding neighborhood, right, that has to work the next day. And so it was a combination of the hotel industry with, you know, some disgruntled full-time residents. Um, and so it really pushed the politicians to kind of take a step back and look at it. Um, but then on the flip side, I did see, you know, in selling real estate, um, maybe a grandmother who has maybe like a separate, what we call Ohana, maybe a guest quarters or a mother-in-law's quarters that was just trying to make her ends meet. And she would just vacation rent it and that would help her pay her mortgage. So I did see that side of it. Um, and I think our island did the best, our county, with really grandfathering in these you know old vacation rentals and really working with the community to try to find a balance instead of I think the other islands are a little bit more strict they just you know honed in and said no only this many and no more vacation rentals or only these areas of the island can be vacation renting and nothing else they all have to stop and so our county council I think did a great job of just trying to you know work with everyone of finding a balance instead of just you know not working with the vacation rental owners, which is nice, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Cause short-term rentals, I mean, like a lot of people make ends meet by renting out an extra bedroom or renting out their guest house. And when you take that away, I mean, it really does hurt a lot of people. Um, right. So I'm really glad to hear that you guys handle that differently than, you know, on the other Island. But so let me ask you this then um, when you got into real estate, was it just about, cause you said you kind of fell into vacation rentals because most of it at the clients are investors um, how are you handling these investors that are coming into your market now that have these like high cash flow demands? Because it's a different market today than it was five years ago or eight years ago. Prices are different. Um, and I would imagine rental rates haven't quite gone up as much as prices. As, in fact, we know they haven't. Um, right. so that, that means that the returns have kind of diminished, right. but still have investors with these expectations. So what are you doing when you get these people that just like demand, you know, these crazy returns? Are you just like telling them, no, I can't help you? No, I, you know, when I first got into real estate, I had a broker and he explained to me, it's not selling real estate to people. It's educating them about buying real estate. And so it's really, I find educating them of, you know, if they want to buy in a certain area, I don't flat out say no. I just kind of help them with their expectations, you know, and um, it usually works out because they may have wanted to live, you know, they see a really cheap vacation rental. And then you have to explain, you know, there's no cost school nearby or just the different areas. And then um, so that's really helped just educating them of what their expectations are. Their cap rate may not be double digits like they're used to. You know, the HOA fees might be a little bit higher, but say, for example, they don't have a mortgage. So just kind of putting them in that formula of what they're looking at, what are their expectations, and then just seeing how they can make a profit, um, you know, vacation renting. And I do find people that strictly run it at like a business, and you would probably agree with this, they do make money as a profit. And then you have, you know, people that just want to buy a second home and just have their, you know, expenses paid for. And so you do have the sometimes intense, you know, just, I'm just an investor, I want that return, and they're going to get it. And then you have the family, you know, that maybe they're paying for their kids in college, and they wanted a second home to go to as a vacation rental. So it's just, just different types of buyers that we do get here. And so you just kind of have to see what their expectations are, where they should buy. Um, for example, you know, the resort areas, you're going to be able to get a higher return, right? The HOAs are higher, but then you, what the, your renters actually get more amenities, right? White sand beaches, restaurants, snorkeling. And so it is a higher price point, but in the long run, that's where they're going to see their return is actually in those areas. Um, is yeah. what I kind of teach them instead of being maybe really in a rural area, you can only you're pretty much going to, you know, vacation rental rates going to be much lower just because they're going to have to rent a car maybe. Right. Or 
drive a while to just see any type of activity or the volcano or something. Well, and one thing that kind of strikes me, like just hearing you talk about this is that we really are talking about two different types of investors. There's the lifestyle mm -hmm. investors who want that lifestyle benefit of being able to use it. And right. then we have our, you know, our numbers investors, our cash flow investors, people like me, people like, I don't know if you're into investing, but you know, I, I'll go anywhere and invest as long as the numbers are good. But then the lifestyle investors, I feel like those are the ones that will be drawn a lot to your market because of the incredible lifestyle benefits of being able to vacation there. Um, but then they're using it all the time, you know? And so when they start using it all the time, it's like, how do you got to get them out of there so that it can yeah. make pay for it? Yes. Like, how do you break it to people that like, look, I know this is your dream to own here. Um, and a lot of people listening might be in that situation. And we kind of have to like bring them back down to reality. It's like, yeah, right. you should stay here. But like, you know, if you stay too much, right. you're going to come out of your pocket for this. Like, how do you right. approach that? I just, from the beginning, just set their expectations of what are they looking for? Because you, you are correct. You do have those two types of buyers, right? Or sometimes they are really investors and then they turn to the lifestyle buyer, right? Because now they're parents and it, we always joke about it. It's like when people buy in Hawaii, all of a sudden they have, these long lost relatives that want to come and visit them or visit where, you know, their property, especially if it's a vacation rental. And so I'll start, I've sold people that strictly want to do vacation renting. And then I, you know, taking my daughter to school and I see them running, you know, exercising. And then I am thinking, don't you have vacation renters? And they said, Oh no, we, we canceled it for this month. We're staying. And so things, you know, stories like that, that you do see uh, people just, you know, when they start visiting here, they want to visit even more, right? And so when you do go to sell, though, I always explain um, to investors that are buying, because a lot of the times we have those lifestyle owners, right? Vacation rental owners. And then you have the real real estate investor, right? And then you have to explain to them because they look at the numbers and they're like, these should be much more. And so you really have to explain to them, okay, well, they're staying here six months of the year or you know, it's only rented out, you know, you have to look at the number of nights and the rates that they're charging. And then, you know, I have a couple of friends that do own property management companies, they just do um, a forecast for them, right, so that they can see, okay, right now it's making this amount, but it can potentially make this amount too. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Property management, you just said it, so I was about to jump in. That is kind of the key component to making this work. I was just at the Verma conference, um, the Vacation Rental Managers Association conference in Las Vegas. And all the property managers from all over the world come together here and talk about, you know, how they can generate more bookings, more revenue. Um, what is the landscape like for finding good property managers over on the big island? I mean, is there a good amount of them? Are they hard to find, especially for vacation rental? Because there's a whole um, artistic aspect, I would say, that goes into marketing a vacation rental versus a long-term rental. Exactly. There's much more. You're more involved, right, with vacation renting. You have to make sure it's cleaned and you know, walkthroughs, is the plumbing okay? You know, is there a water leak? And it's compared to a long-term rental where maybe they're walking through every six months. Um, I would say when I first got into real estate, there wasn't too much of a competition. You had these mom and pop kind of shops. And so they were just price gouging these, some of these owners. And I would look at their numbers and I, had, I remember having an elderly man and he thought he, you know, scored making, I think, $68 that month. And I looked at what he, the revenue he was making. And then they were taking at that time, 55% was their marketing property management fee. So they were just taking most of what he was making. And then as I started looking into it, you know, over the years, um, uh, we have more competition, right? Which is good because that, you know, then their fees had to come down because at that time they were charging anywhere, I would say between 25, 55%, especially in the resort areas. And they weren't, you know, showing up with a flower lay and a Mai Tai, right? For the renters, they were just sending an email. This is the lockbox code and you would never really see them. And so I was still, I was thinking, oh, I wonder what they're charging for. That's kind of, you know, a high fee. But over the years, there's more companies moving in, which forced them to lower their fees, right? And be, it had, so now it's much more competitive. So you can um, have maybe 10% or 8%, right? And then it goes up. And what I'm also seeing are a lot of the property management companies, which I think is smart. They have, you know, they'll ask the owner, what do you want us to do? Because some owners want to be more involved, right, than others. And so they're, the higher the percentage, it means they're, you know, delivering fruit baskets, right? 
and they're, you know, delivering champagne, you know, upon arrival to they're paying the taxes for the owner. So it just scales up, right? The percentage will go up depending on how much involvement uh, the sellers want them to be, which is nice. Instead of years ago, it was just a cookie cutter rate, right? This is what you're going to pay us. And the sellers didn't really have a choice or these homeowners. And so now it's nice to see more competition and then, you know, different plans that they do offer the homeowners now. Yeah. I think competition is so healthy for any market. Whenever you don't have enough competition, that that's what happens. Yeah. Uh, and that's wild. 50%. I mean, just that alone on top of your operating expenses and your utilities, I can't imagine people were turning a profit back then. Right. Um, so I'm glad to hear that's really evolved since then. Now, yeah. is it Requirement to have a property manager run your property for a vacation rental, or can you do it by yourself if you don't want to hire one? I see people do it themselves, but you're supposed to have an on island representative when you do apply for your permit. And um, so you are supposed to have a representative on island. And that's just in case, you know, some there's a complaint and the county has a, it's actually a contact person, right? That they can call to, you know, go to the property so that there's at least some accountability because years ago there was no one on island and so there was no one you know if there was something going on or vacation renters are partying overnight then there was no one you know where a homeowner could call the county and say okay who's their contact that we could call to you know to yeah yeah follow the rules basically so that is nice that the county did that so there at least there's a contact person on every vacation rental Mm -hmm. so Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, because these days buying a vacation rental, it's not good enough anymore to just buy a property, put nice furniture in it and stick it on Airbnb. Like this is one of the big topics at Burma this year was it really has to stand out. I mean, there's so much competition in the market now um, that it's just got to stand out. Like what are people really wanting when they come to Hawaii from a vacation rental? Like how do you create that unique experience where they're going to stay at your place and it's unforgettable and they're going to come back again and they're happy to pay the rate. Well, I've seen actually some homeowners, like you were just saying, they put in, you know, I think it's maintaining the unit, right. Or the property. So if it looks nice, right. It has nice furniture. It's not all raggedy and busted up. I'm also seeing them have these welcome baskets, right. So all these added touches that you could get at a hotel, but you're getting that in a vacation rental really stands out. And I think also how responsive um, the property manager is or the homeowner, you know, where they're able to, you know, quickly get an answer if something, the internet goes down or something, right? I feel like it's really servicing the renter, um, being responsive, giving them a good quality product is what they're looking for. I do see a lot of vacation rentals, which this is smart because we are in Hawaii, right? They have surfboards, snorkeling gear. So they supply them with all these things for the families to use instead of a family having to go out and um, buy all of those items, right? Just to go to the beach. I do have another client and this was smart because I always thought about this in COVID. They had moved or they either sold a lot of the rental cars or they moved them to another island, right? And they held them at the stadium in Oahu. So rental cars were so hard to come by. So what he started doing was just buying cars. And then he supplies that, you know, because this island is so large with the, his vacation rentals so that his families that visit, they don't have to go and try to find, you know, oh, it's the Ironman World Triathlon. There's no vacation rental, uh, no cars, right? And so he, he saw that that was a need, you know, depending on what was event was happening on the island. So he just started buying cars and he supplies it now with his properties, which his renters absolutely love because they don't have to, you know, it's one extra thing they have to try to find on the island. So he just includes it. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. That's actually one of the best ideas I've heard. And I'm sure he has people like with no problem to pay the rate that he's charging. Cause like, exactly. one, and that's really, really smart. Um, what about like, uh, millennials, right? Millennials love Instagram and everything's all about like what it looks like posting on their Instagram. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anybody doing any like really over the top themes inside their home to where it's like gone Instagram viral or have we not hit that point yet? I don't think we've really hit that point yet here, but uh, I find the vacation rentals that make quite a bit of money are the ones that of course have everything supplied in the home the service. I mean, they really, you know, upkeep their homes compared to a home 
hasn't been really looked at for a while and it's just, you know, constant turnover, then those rates are not as high. And then I do, I don't know if you come across this, but I'm coming across quite a bit of rentals that are, you know, their rates are a couple years old. So they haven't really caught up with increasing them. Um, so I don't know if that's a combination of just the property management company not really being involved and saying, you know, I think we can increase these rates here. Um, yeah. I mean, it sounds like they're not using dynamic pricing software. Yeah. You know, most smart owners and managers are going to use that dynamic pricing software, which is going to keep the rates in alignment with, you know, people traveling to the island, certain points, yeah. events, it, you know, it goes, it's just like airline tickets, right? Right. I've noticed like a lot of like maybe single owners that aren't hiring a manager or mom and pop managers just don't leverage that kind of tech. But right. too, in that, that comment about raising rates, I mean, with the way prices have gone up and the way inflation is going, I mean, you have to start raising your rates. Like you can't just not raise your rates or you're not going to make money. Um, right. You might be really booked out, but then the cost of providing those supplies to those renters have gone up. Um, exactly. Labor expenses have gone up. So if uh, people aren't doing that, I mean, I would say they probably need a new manager because that that's got to be adjusted every year based right. on what in the market. Right. Um, what I'm seeing, what's interesting in a trend in the vacation rental industry right now, is this like tiny house movement? These really like small, unique stays. I don't know. I know probably not anywhere near the the water. But what about like inland, where maybe there's more land um, and ways to do this, like. Are you seeing anybody doing these like tiny houses or tree house experiences or anything like that? I, I do. They were either with our zoning though. I always have to explain to people. So tiny homes with our County, it falls under the department of motor vehicle. Um, mm -hmm. And Hawaii doesn't have trailer parks or anything in our state. So it's something new that our government, I feel hasn't caught up with, with passing, you know, these laws and zoning of those tiny homes. I do see tiny homes in like the volcano area and around the island where people are vacation renting, but it would have to, if, you know, to do that, it would have to have the proper zoning with our county and state. The homeowner would probably live on that property, so it would be considered a hosted rental. Um, and then it would also have to, usually where I'm seeing those tiny homes and their vacation renting, the owner lives there and the subdivision uh, CCNRs, right? Are, they allow vacation renting also. And so those are just different things. I tell people when we're looking at the different neighborhoods of what they can do. Um, most of the time though, now since they passed that law a couple of years ago, you're, you can't just start building tiny homes and vacation renting anymore, unless they were pretty much either grandfathered in or the owner actually lives on the property um, full time. So that, and I think our government's kind of behind on that. They're still trying to navigate that of the tiny homes concept, but I am seeing more tiny homes, more bamboo homes, which are really cool. Um, and there is one I saw in the volcano area. It was like a modern tree house and they vacation rent it oh, and it cool. looks solid. Yeah. I went to go look it up and say, okay, can we rent it? But it's book solid. It's, it's incredible how that owner had that concept. I've seen that happening all over is like these smaller unique stays are just booked solid because the millennials just love that unique experience. That's why I was asking um, if you could do that anywhere, because if you can, that's a major opportunity right now um, in an underserved market uh, right. with islands. So I think there's a lot of revenue opportunities there. Um, what about land and building vacation rentals? Like, is that something people can still do? Or I would imagine like really nobody's got land left to sell. We have quite a bit of land to sell. I think it's 10% of this entire island is owned to be developed. That's it. So most of it, they would not be able to build. So that's why I will always keep the inventory low on the island, unless the state and county starts changing our zoning. Um, but to build that kind of a concept, you would have to build it in a resort zoned area. And I live in a resort zoning area. So you would have to either buy land and then change the zoning, which could take quite a bit of time and money in our state to do. Um, then that's only because most of the property here is zoned. There's two types of zoning, it's county and state. And so the state will always override the county, right? So maybe the county will allow it, but then the state zoning won't. And so it has to match up um, to be able to do that. But mostly um, in resort zones, if it's already resort zoning, you can definitely go ahead and start building and vacation renting. It, oh, it, interesting. Yeah. So if someone wants to do that, it's going to be resort zoned. Um, are they taxed differently in the resort area? 
they are we're taxed at a higher um okay. I, they just changed it if it's too, if the home is worth two million and you know up they i think almost doubled the property taxes but hawaii's property taxes are still low um compared to the rest of the country because our property taxes don't fund into our department of education system that comes out of the state general fund which a lot of people look at the property tax rate and it's much lower and that's just because the state fund you know state funds a public education system not the property taxes the property taxes go to the counties so it's a little bit different so that's good that it's not as high as say california which people get excited to see yeah do you get a lot of in california um buying properties there right now we it, we do and since covid it's fascinating the different countries that now buy in in hawaii to a lot of the states we're seeing a lot of east coast states texas i've had people buy from alabama and you know normally it would be washington california right oregon arizona buying in hawaii and so you're seeing more people from florida is one of the top 10 that state so they're migrating you know across the country which is interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. I think our, our beaches are just getting um, really crowded here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they're trying something new. Um, yeah. Well, we only have about a minute left, and I really want to take that opportunity for you to share a little bit about how people can get in touch with you. If someone's interested in working with you, what the approach is like, okay. um, you know, what the next steps would be if they want to, you know, be working with someone at your knowledge level and what kind of clients you do take on, because I understand, you know, I'm sure you don't just take every client. It's too much for you. <laughs> I co-own the real estate company with my mom. Um, she's a listing agent on this new development that's going to happen, which the first phase is going to be workforce housing, right? A combination of different types of housing, which our island, I think, is about 15,000 homes short with our current residents. So we have a lot more homes to build just to service the residents here. But um, I do help all walks of life. I am born and raised here. And so you grow up with all walks of life. And so I... Go ahead and sell to vacation renters, first time home buyers, single moms, you know, and businessmen. Um, to get in touch with me, they could either give me a call on my cell phone, it's 808 936 1800, or my email is my first name, Lailan, L A I L A N, at high dev group. So H I D E V. G R O U P dot com, Lylon at high death group dot com. And the name of my company is Hawaii Development Group, is our real estate company. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It was great chatting with you. I learned a lot. Um, and for anyone listening, definitely reach out to her if you have any questions about investing in the Hawaii market. She knows her stuff. And uh, we really hope to see you on the next show where we have some more interesting topics to dive into on vacation rentals. Thank you yes. all for coming. Aloha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.